Welcome back. We're at Lecture 27, uh, Math 241. Uh, I mentioned the other day that why, um, or asked you to go look at why $1,000 is called a grand, and then I reported back the next day, and the look on your faces was that of disbelief. So here is a picture of a $1,000 bill from late 1700s. See the zeros? You can zoom in on that a little bit more on one of the zeros. <laughs> Apparently, that's why it was called a grand. It was originally called the grand watermelon note. And if you look at the background here, in the background of these three zeros, not only is it not a very round looking zero, it's kind of a watermelon like zero, that background uh, got it the nickname <coughs> of the grand watermelon note and then later she got shortened to that which was a grand. So if you're like me, uh, you haven't seen too many of these in your lifetime, thousand dollar bills, but this was the, the first one. And that's why it's called a grand. So that makes it hopefully a little more <coughs> believable that it is a, um, that that is historically. Now there also is one for why a dollar is called a buck. And I don't remember that one, but I was thinking about that today walking over here, so I think I have to look that one up again. Uh, we did the logistic population growth model, uh, certainly not to do it again, but to show you where we started with a differential equation. So initially it's kind of exponential. We changed the lettering a little different, differently from the book. So there was a capital K here, and this is supposed to be a lowercase k, so we call this L, which is the limiting population or the carrying capacity. Um, so the rate of change of population is directly proportional to the population. Uh, and in addition to that, we have this kind of limiting factor. As P gets close to L, the population growth rate gets very, very close to zero. So we went through the whole thing, decom decomposed into partial fractions, and came up with, there's a whole lot here where the dots are that you're not responsible for as far as developing that in a test, but we came up with this equation. So we can use that. I think we did use that, right? We predicted we took uh, some data from 1970. I didn't bring this with me, so I'm having to guess. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. 70 to 1990, is that the data we used? Population of the U.S.? And we kind of made up a um, limiting value or a carrying capacity of 500 million and predicted the population in 2010 to be just shy of 300 million. Sound right? And uh, I think the population of the U.S. is actually already in 2009 over 300 million. So it underpredicted, so uh, it's not a... a foolproof prediction model by any means, but it, it does use the limiting value or the carrying capacity rather than just an uninhibited growth model. Uh, we also did some web assigned questions, but we didn't have time for enough of them. So let's do that. A couple of other things from the text to finish up 7.5, and tomorrow we'll be dedicated to reviewing the test looking at an old test that has been given on this, and Wednesday in here for this group of students that are in the <coughs> studio classroom this semester, your test is Wednesday. Uh, we did number three on WebAssign. Um, also number four was mentioned. What is that? It's um, find the solution of the differential equation that satisfies the given initial condition. And that's x plus 2y square root x squared plus 1. Uh, it's, it's not plus. It's just multiplied by square root 2y. 2y times? Yeah. Okay, we'll just make that a big dot here. <laughs> times. x squared plus 1. 2y dx. So the outside here. right here? Mm -hmm. Equals 0. And the initial condition is y of 0 equals 1. So, and x equals 0, y is equal to 1. 
Uh, that concerned me a little bit that we had addition, but the fact that we've got equal zero means that we can move one term to the other side and it will simply be the negative of that. So let's do that. Let's move the uh, x term to the other side, which would now be negative x. So what is the process from here? This is all at the end of the problem, this information here. And that'll help us solve for c or k or whatever we have in the problem at that point in time. Um, what's going to work here? OK, well, let's get the dx's where they're going to go. And divide by x squared plus 1. Square root? It is a square root, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think that's it. So 2y dy equals So the left side looks pretty benign as far as trying to integrate that. How about the right side? What looks like it might work on the right yeah. side? Use substitution. Use substitution. Use substitution. Now, if this were uh, <coughs> 1 plus x squared and we didn't have the square root, then we might be possibly thinking uh, inverse tangent. But I think if we call this x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half, times negative x times dx, then I think we're in business for substitution. Let u equal x squared plus 1. du is 2x dx. So we're going to integrate 2y dy. So what do we need, and how do we accomplish that? OK, well, we don't need the negative, right? So we can kind of slide that out in front. Or we can multiply by negative 1 there and also here. And we need a 2. So we need a 1 half out in front. So that ought to be du, which it looks like du, and that ought to be u to the negative 1 half. All right, so left side is what? <laughs> Integral of 2y dy. Y Possibility of a constant, which we'll throw in on the other side. Just kind of stuck with that out in front. And we've got u to the negative 1 half du, which integrates to Two to the right, u to the one half over one half, or two u to the one half. So two u to the one half. Does that work? We've got an arbitrary constant that we're putting together from both sides. We'll just put it on the right side. So we can knock out these, and we have negative. Is that a little bizarre looking to you? So I guess we're going to have to compensate for that with the C, right? Because I'm not liking the fact that y squared is the negative of some principal square root. So we do have negative here. We're going to have to correct that with the constant. Um, how does it? say the answer blank in web assign. What does it say? Does it say y equals? Mm -hmm. Y equals? OK. Let's go ahead and sub now for um, x equals 0 and y equals 1. So that would be 1. x is 0. So that gives us c as what? 2. 2. two? So 
our equation. Is that, and I guess if we want to solve for y, since we're doing the taking of the square root, let me see if we've got anything that's going to tell us any differently here in this problem. What I'm deliberating right now is do we need both of those, plus or minus? No, it's not plus. Okay, how can we not include both of them? Because you already solved for your C. To make sure that we're dealing with something <laughs> positive. Well, probably put Kelly on the spot. What do you think, Kelly? Do you think we ought to have plus or minus? Is that fair? Is that not fair to ask him as soon as he comes in? <laughs> Sorry. I think we should. Plus or minus? Yes, Both sir. of them? Yeah, he says yes. I don't see any reason to not. I mean, this part's taken care of. We know that what's under the radical is positive. We know that. Otherwise, we can't do the problem. Now, to get from this equation to this equation, I think we have to allow for both possibilities. Now, web assign might take just the principal square root, but I don't see anything that says we can eliminate the negative at this point. I mean, we do have a specific point, x equals 0, y equals 1, but that's not to say that y can't be negative. y equals a negative, it's possible. Does that work? Anybody had questions? Is it, are your questions answered on this? Okay. Six was another problem that was asked about. Now, I think we set up six, and I'm not sure how far we got with six in class as an example. Um, we like did the whole thing, yeah. six all the way through. Does anybody still have a question on six? I got an email that said we had a question. We didn't do it as the first example because um, it had two different kind of spigots coming into the tank. So I think we did that when we were doing tank problems uh, at the end of 7.3. Yeah, we did an example from the book, and I didn't know if it was a web assigned question, and it turned out that it was. So we did problem 38 from the textbook, which is number 6. I mean, just in case somebody has a, an issue with the setup, let's get it set up. Um, so we've got rate of change of salt. So you might have that what we wrote down that day, what did I call salt? A? Yeah. A was the amount of salt. So the rate of change of salt is the rate at which salt is coming in. Uh, we have two things coming in, 0 0.05 kilograms of salt per liter. And that is entering the tank at a rate of 5 liters per minute. We also, so I know this wasn't the first example we did, but I, we did the problem that same day we started out doing tank problems. Also coming in 0 0.04 kilograms of salt per liter. And that's 10 liters per minute. So you can see the liters knocking out and it should sound like an amount of salt coming in, which it's kilograms per minute, kilograms per minute. And now leaving the tank, we have A, K, 
kilograms of salt at any point in time equally distributed in the 1,000 liters which is what we started with the stuff coming in and the stuff going out is the same so we ought to have a thousand liters at any point in time. Um, Fifteen liters per minute. So one more step, and then if we have any more further questions, we can go further. But uh, we can add these two together. Their product added to their product. What was that? I have that written down. 0.65. And then we could reduce 15 over 1,000. What did we come up with there? 200. And this, it, is that the first problem we had to do that? Maybe the first problem where we had to actually factor out the lead coefficient of A so that makes the separation of variables a little bit easier so let's write down one more step. So if we factor out negative 3 over 200 we got A minus okay, I knew we got that somewhere. 130 over 3? Yeah. So we separated, integrated both sides. Uh, any further issues with this one? So if you had questions on number six, check out what we did on 38 because it is exactly the same problem. Any other web assigned questions? Anything as you look through there that you thought was a question? I don't have a hard copy of it. What's five look like, Daniel? Find the orthogonal trajectories of the family of curves. Is that one, mm -hmm. orthogonal trajectories? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it might be a test question. Find the orthogonal trajectories. Is that it, Nicole? No, it wasn't that one. No, it was. Where did you that? We're okay? We're good on web assign? Yeah. Okay, and I think I changed that deadline. Am I thinking right ahead? 5,000 things to do Friday. I think that was one of the things I did. So that's due tonight, I believe. All right, so let's wrap up 7.5 and uh, look at some other models. We're not going to have test questions on this, but just so you can see how you could take the models that we have. Here are a couple that we have, and these look like population growth models, but they could be anything that's growing exponentially. So we did that one and we got that population. That's kind of our standard exponential population growth or it could be decay actually depending on the sign of K. Uh, and we've seen that and you probably ought to know that coming into the test that that's kind of good old-fashioned regular exponential growth. We've seen that as a lot of different models, e to the ct or e to the kt. Actually, this is exactly the same mathematical model, which is, what is that? Continuously compounded. Continuously compounded interest. So if we know the interest rate, we know the time, we know the amount that we're throwing in there, this is the most that that money could make at that interest rate for that length of time compounding it more than every minute, more than every second, compounding continuously. Though kind of the main thing that we took the time to develop, the development of it is not a test question, but we got the limiting value in the numerator. We got that equation. Um, if we have a logistic population growth problem, um, that will be given to you. Okay, That equation will be given to you. We did an example, so we took two data points. Whatever we decided was our first data point, we call that time zero. 
Second data point is so many years after time zero, and then where we're trying to use that to predict is also so many years after time zero. I think our second data point was 20 years after time zero, and our prediction point was 40 years, is that right? After time zero. So we can plug those things in, uh, find A from our first data point. Let me back up. L is given to us in the problem, or we in fact made up in our problem. I think it's probably better for me to give you that in the problem for consistency of answers. A, you find with the first data point, K, and then negate it, plug it into the formula you find with the second data point. Some other models that are shown here that I think are worth a couple of minutes of class time. So we've got this limiting value in this one. Now, tell me what you think this term does to that same model that we looked at before, which has this asymptotic effect when the population is very close to capital L. What do you think that would do? Like a boundary on the bottom? Kind of a boundary on the bottom. So it's uh, almost like an extinction type term <coughs> in here that is if the population is very close to M, so whatever M is, this uh, kind of magic number that as the population gets close to that, it can potentially go to extinction. So this gives us a kind of an upper limit for the population. This gives us a lower limit, an extinction value. But both have the same effect in, a, in the sense that as P approaches M, this term approaches zero, which kind of flatlines the population. Here, as P approaches L, this term is zero, which says the rate of growth is zero, which kind of, again, flatlines the, the growth of the population. So that's kind of the same model with a lower limit or an extinction term put in. See what you think this model would do, which is also mentioned in the book, but not a whole lot is done with it at this point in time. You'll probably see it again in your differential equations course to actually solve for it. What do you think would cause that? So this would be if you were going to harvest some of the population, like uh, fish, let's say, for example, uh, that are getting too densely populated in a confined area, pond or lake. They would harvest some to have the water then would be more oxygenated. There's more food for the existing fish. Um, in fact, I have fished, I love fishing, and I've fished in some ponds that were so loaded with brim that the owner of the pond, uh, sounds kind of cruel, but told me if I catch some smaller brim to not put them back in to just throw them on the bank for the turtles because it was too loaded with brim to, so that they weren't, the bass and the brim weren't growing at the rate they should have been growing. There wasn't enough food. So uh, seems kind of cruel, but I, harvesting goes on. I guess we all probably had some chicken this weekend. Unfortunately, that was, you know, kind of a <laughs> chicken that was probably grown up for that purpose. It seems kind of sad. But that would be a harvesting <laughs> model. This next section uh, in the book is something that we're not going to cover, but let me spend two minutes on it to show you because you'll probably see it again in your differential equations course. It's called a predator-prey system. Um, kind of coexisting populations that um, have very interesting growth rates, one with respect to the other. So there's a good example in there on rabbits and wolves. So let's say that the wolf population 
is growing, well, in order for it to grow, there must be, which this assumed that this is one of their main um, food sources, that there must be a lot of rabbits in order for the wolf population to be growing. But as the wolf population is growing, what's happening to the rabbit population? Oh, it's declining because they're getting their nourishment that way. And at a certain point, the rabbit population is not completely made extinct, but it's to the point where it can't support that number of wolves that have grown in population because there were an ample amount of rabbits. So now the rabbit population is down. What happens to the wolf population as a result? It starts decreasing. It starts decreasing. And if it decreases to the point where the rabbits, and you know rabbits, are uh, increasing fairly rapidly, so then the rabbit population comes up while the wolf population is declining, then after the rabbit population gets up there to a point where it's higher than normal, there's more out there for the wolves to eat, so therefore they can have more wolves and it supports more wolves. Do you see how the two populations interact? So if you would sketch them, instead of looking like this, which is exponential growth, or this, which is logistic population growth, you would see, and they call this a phase plane, that while one is growing, the other is decaying, and then kind of vice versa, and you end up back here. And depending upon the value that you um, establish for your starting point, you can have kind of differing results here, but they all kind of go back to where you started, and they're somewhat elliptical in shape. Kind of interesting interaction of two populations where one is the predator, the other is the prey, and as one population is growing, the other's declining, um, and so on. So you will visit that again. Unfortunately, it's not a part of this course anymore. All right, well, we have some time, so I thought tomorrow would be kind of crunched if we did all the review tomorrow. So let's go back and start to talk about some of the things for uh, the test. Don't think I have an old test with me today. Like We can make sure we do that tomorrow. All right, so our test one ended with 6.4, average value of a function. So we will begin with 6.5, which was loaded. In fact, a lot of these sections that we are including on this test have multiple topics within that section. So test two, first topic looks like um, chapter six, section five. We had in there spring problems. Is that our first problem? Uh, what else did we have there? Are there applications to physics and engineering? Uh, moment, center of mass, regular old work problems where we took force times distance and integrated that over the uh, normally the kind of start time to the end time. We had uh, hydrostatic pressure. where we took the kind of the end of the tank or the submerged plate and we took little pieces of area, little elements of area parallel to the surface of the liquid. And we integrated what? The density of the stuff doing the pressing, the depth of each individual piece, right? Each little rectangle times the area, right? from the kind of top to the bottom of that particular. Uh, 
Um, might be a good thing if you've got your web assign caught up and done to take a look back at those things. I don't know that we're going to have a time, enough time tomorrow to look at an example of each type. Um, but as you look back, and we can do maybe two of the four here in an example problem, or at least set it up to the point where you could take it from there. Uh, what I think is important on a lot of these is to get a diagram so you can look at the little skinny little rectangles parallel to the surface of the water uh, center of mass. That will probably involve a little bit of memorization on your part. Uh, what's the center of mass in terms of the x value, the centroid? What's the center of mass as far as the y value? We did not do 6.6 six or 6.7. Six, so we then went to chapter 7. This is kind of an odd section at, in a sense to find a test question from because this was just introductory. What are these things called slope fields? If we have a differential equation and we're handed a solution, can we validate a solution? Uh, what else did we have in 7 1? They talked about um, logistic growth, but we didn't do anything with it really other than look at the differential equation. They talked about spring problems. We didn't really solve any uh, motion of spring problems. Uh, they had a second derivative in them, so that was a second order differential equation, uh, talked about initial value problems and how that enters in. So just about everything that was introduced in 7.1 we looked at later or we will look at as we continue uh, kind of outside the book in the using second order differential equations. Uh, slope fields, again, a little more specifically, and approximating solutions. Using Euler's method. So you might want to take a look at that uh, before coming to class tomorrow. We can talk about how it is we would generate a slope field. I probably will not time-wise be asking you to generate a slope field, but maybe at a couple of points, what would the slope look like, the tiny little line segment that kind of serves as a little guidepost or signpost, what would a couple of them look like? Um, what would, I think there's a web assigned question on what would the nature of solutions look like uh, in a certain slope field if the y of 0 was 4 or if the y of 0 was negative 3. Didn't you have one that was a picture and you had to picture what different solutions would be like that went through different points in the plane? Take a look back at that web assign. I'm pretty sure there's one of those on web assign. And Euler's method. Euler's method, we're going to take the tangent line to the curve as long as it's the delta x is fairly small and we're going to go along the tangent line to the curve and find the next point even though the tangent line is not exactly on the curve itself we're going to use the tangent and we're going to have um, the differential equation given to us so that is the slope so we are then able to find uh, a description of the slope in terms of x's and y's and numbers so we would start with an x0, that's going to be given to us, and a y0, and then it's our task to find x1, that's usually the easier part, I hope it is. How do you find the new x value in terms of the old x value? Old x plus <coughs> the change in x. To get the new y, we would start with the old y, and then what? kind of arithmetic do we do 
is x and y values into the function that you're given. Right. So we would have this differential equation, right? And if it's in terms of x's and y's and numbers, we'll plug in x0 and y0 because we're trying to generate x1 and y1. We use the predecessor times delta x, the change in x along the tangent to the curve, and the change in x along the curve itself are exactly the same. So it's kind of old y plus the change in y along the tangent to the curve. And then that becomes our data to generate our next one, right? x2 found the same way, y2 found in a similar fashion. So Euler's method, be prepared on the test to have an Euler's method problem from 7.3. You can help me prioritize these things tomorrow, that if we need to look at a work problem, we can set one up. Or if we don't, then we need to do a spring problem. If not that, then maybe a hydrostatic pressure problem. We're not going to have time to do all these. 7.3 was loaded with different things, just the concept of separable differential equations. We've done pretty much every type that you could possibly do in some way, shape, or form with examples from 7.3 and 7.4 and also 7.5. Um, we did some circuit problems. <coughs> More than likely, at this point in time, I know we'll revisit circuit problems. At this point in time, I would probably provide what it is that you need as far as the, the laws that govern voltage drops and so on. Um, orthogonal trajectories. Let's talk for a few seconds about uh, what are those orthogonal trajectories. That was a long time ago. I, don't, I have a short memory. I'm an old man. Tell me what orthogonal trajectories are. I'm an old man that painted all weekend. I'm so glad to be back here and have the paintbrush at home. These curves that uh, intersect another set of curves um, perpendicularly. Okay. So curves that intersect other curves, and they are mutually perpendicular, right? Actually, the curves themselves, it's kind of difficult for them to be forming right angles, but the tangent lines at the points of intersection are perpendicular. So we've got a curve here and another curve here. So actually, this tangent line and this tangent line are perpendicular. So if we know the slope of one set of curves, what do we do to generate this new family of curves that serve as the orthogonal trajectories? What do we do with the original slope? Take the negative reciprocal. Take the negative reciprocal, right? And then use the separable differential equation technique and kind of get out from under the differential equation and what is the family of curves for which their derivatives are negative reciprocals of the original set of derivatives. And the fourth type would be the tank problems. Uh, just in case you were thinking, you know, gosh, this test is loaded with stuff, he might not put a tank problem in. That will not happen. This I've never given a test over this material and not included a tank problem. And if you want to make a note for yourself, that this will also be a problem for the final exam. There will be a tank problem on the final exam as well. So it's a, I think it's one of the major types of problems that we do over this material. And it, and it actually encompasses quite a bit. Pardon? The salt thing? Yeah, the salt, the brine, the pesticide, the, I don't know what else we did, the room with the CO2, all those are tank problems. Uh, fourth section, uh, regular exponential growth and decay. So 
So that's kind of the standard version. You need to know that version coming into the test. And that's going to work for both growth and decay. If it's growth, K is positive. And if it's decay, K is negative. So what did we do here? We did um, population. Did we do a population growth? I can't remember the example we did here. Population of Raleigh, maybe? Oh, you did my little town. Oh, that's right. We did your town, which was Moon, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which brought to mind, I don't know if I mentioned it that day, my college roommate went to Moon High School. Did I bring that up? Mm -hmm. That's bizarre, but it's in Pennsylvania. Moon Township, the Moon Tigers. So it wasn't the first moon that I've heard of. We also did a decay. We did the uh, carbon dating problem where the C14 was decaying, uh, half-life of 5,750 years, and we determined the uh, linen wrapping in the Dead Sea Scrolls, how old they were approximately. Um, let's see. So that's regular population growth and decay. We did Newton's Law of Cooling. I think that's probably fair if I ask you to know that coming in because it's very similar to just regular exponential growth. How does that look different? Now, I don't know if this book has negative K here. You don't really need the negative K. K turns out to be negative, right, if it's cooling. So I'll just put K. K is a negative number. It's got a little extra baggage tacked onto the end. Surrounding medium, temperature of the surrounding medium. So it looks very similar to just exponential decay with this guy added onto the end. Uh, we also did continuously compounded interest, which really kind of comes into this model. It's the same exact model. Uh, from the logistic model, good. So tomorrow we can just do problems from an old test and kind of other problems that you want us to do. And what does that look like? Looks like the limiting value in the numerator. Again, you don't have to have the negative KT. It turns out that K is negative. So whether you have the negative sign or not there, it's going to be negative anyway. So it's a number in that exponent position. Uh, there is some, if you're looking through 7.5, they do Euler's method again. We've already done Euler's method. We've got a, an exact solution to this, so we don't need to approximate it. Um, I've told you you're not responsible for the development of this, and you're also not responsible for that harvesting model we looked at and the extinction model. But you can change uh, existing models to kind of make it uh, Make it what you want it to be based on the extinction or the harvesting portion of that model. Okay, we're in good shape to just do kind of problems all day tomorrow, and Wednesday in here we'll take the test. So if you have problems that you want to make sure we do, you need to bring those in, or at least the type that you want to do, and we'll find one.